Maybe they're born with it. Maybe it's sleep deprivation. Oh, this was a bad idea. Hello friends and welcome to a new video. Okay, so full disclosure, this was supposed to be done for June, but uh, every month is Pride Month when you're a big old queer and uh, Manchester Pride is usually in August. So does it really matter that I took my eye off the ball and lost a month somewhere? I don't know, I'm not your real dad. I was hugely inspired by Morgan Donner's heraldic gown, have been desperately wanting to make one since that video came out, which is like nearly three years ago now. It was finally time to actually make a supportive late medieval kirtle pattern and decide on a design, which as you've probably guessed, I decided the closest thing to my heraldry was my pride flags. Yes, flags multiple. We'll get to that. Full disclosure, I also mostly forgot to film the process of making these, but I was thinking of them as basically wearable mock-ups anyway, so like, there will be a better video on making this style of gown in future. In the meantime, if you want to make something like this, or indeed almost identical to this, Morgan Donner has explained it far better than I ever could, and that's basically the instructions I followed when making these. I have described this as a supportive kirtle, but on me, fitted is probably a better descriptor. If you have breasts, this style of gown can lift and support your bust in a really flattering way, so don't be afraid of tackling it if you're on the curvier side, but equally I think it looks pretty good on a straighter figure too. It's such a feminine style, I was really concerned it would just wouldn't work on my body, but I'm actually really happy with the results. So what is this video other than chaos? Well, it's actually the first of two on two different, but connected subjects. This is the fun friendly video where you get to see a cool finished project, I'm going to talk a bit about gender and sexuality and pride, answer a bunch of questions, everybody feels good. We'll get back to that second one later. So let's start with the basics. What is pride? Pride is the celebration and ongoing call to action of the LGBTQ plus community. It is a time where we connect with our friends, partners, found families, supportive relatives, we celebrate our culture, our past, the rights we have won, we honour our elders, we remind everyone else that we still exist and do not have parity in many areas, and we recognise the battles we are still fighting and the work that still needs to be done. If you live in a big city, there's often a March, and depending on where you live, that can feel more like a parade or more like a protest. It's usually both. There's also a lot of like drinking focused events and ableism and minority exclusion and corporate branding and rainbow washing of products because despite claims otherwise, queer money spends just the same. I say that like I don't buy white skittles literally every year. Look, pride is not without its issues, but that's a much bigger subject than I'm equipped to tackle in this video. I'm just a costumer. I'll make a playlist for you with a whole bunch more queer history. What does LGBTQ plus mean? You'll see a bunch of different versions of this acronym floating around, and they broadly all mean the same thing. It can go as short as LGBT, or as long as LGBTQIA+, or some people just find the whole thing a mouthful and say queer, which is the Q in LGBTQ. If we take the longest version of the acronym, you have lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, asexual and aromantic, and then the plus kind of leaves us open for the fact that we are almost certainly not done, because our understanding of gender and sexuality is still evolving after centuries of oppression and the active suppression of studies and scientific data on the subject, but also this acronym is getting out of hand. What are the pride flags? The original pride flag is the six colour rainbow, or at least the original flag that is still in use. Eight and seven colour versions did exist briefly, but the six colour flag is the one that has been used most widely and is most recognisable. There have been a couple of variations to this flag as well. One that you're most likely to have seen in the wild is the progress flag, which adds a chevron to centre trans people and people of colour as the groups under the queer umbrella currently most in need of support and recognition. This flag represents everybody who is not straight and cisgender. If you're still figuring stuff out, or you're moving between labels, or you're just asking yourself some questions, or you identify as any of the things in the acronym, this is your flag. But queers love a colour scheme, so there are more flags. There are a lot more flags. There are in fact flags for basically every identity you can think of, including heterosexual. If you are straight, we made you a flag. Here it is. What this means for a lot of people is, as well as the rainbow, they might have one or more other flags that represents their identity more specifically. Or, you know, in my case, um, 
five. So, from the top, we have bisexual, grey asexual, demi romantic, transgender, and non binary. Yup! All of those, all of those is me. All of these flags represent different aspects that make up my identity and that need to be acknowledged and protected in order for me to live as the happy, mostly healthy, supported, employed, legally married and in love person that I am. However, I'm sewing a gown and five flags is too many flags. I had a bit of soul searching on which of these flags was the best representation of me and which would combine best to best represent my identity and in the end I kicked Demi Romantic out because I don't like grey and green as a colour scheme. Yeah, I know, I know. I'm a bad person. So project wise, I drafted a kirtle pattern based on Morgan Donner's video. Watch Morgan Donner's video. I'm not going to explain it. It's not that complicated. You can do it. Watch the video. I did some test fittings, tweaked a few things, did some more, tweaked a few things, did some more, went, hey, that's probably fine. Uh, yeah, these don't fit perfectly. I've made some further alterations to the master pattern, but they were good enough. Mostly I just need a bit more ease in the front armhole. I drew up a full version of the pattern, including all the skirts, made the skirts kind of too long, watch out for that, and then it was fun and games time putting all the flags in. So I settled on making two gowns, an undergown that would lace up the front, which I decided would be half the trans flag and half the non-binary flag, and an overgown that would lace up the sides and have deep skirt openings for horse riding and sword carrying and, you know, shenanigans, which would be half the bisexual flag and half the asexual flag. I settled on using the regular asexual flag because I was not messing around with pastels and chevrons on top of everything else. I am still under the umbrella. It's still my flag. It's just like got an asterisk next to it. You know. So, to make things more visually appealing and make my life infinitely more difficult, I decided that the trans and bi flags would run vertically and the asexual and non-binary flags horizontally. For the asexual and non-binary flags, this actually made my life very easy. I measured the pattern top to bottom, divided it into four, did a bit of measuring to curve it around the skirts. Job done, same pattern for both. But then there were these two. I actually stressed out a lot about these two flags and eventually just sat down and measured out the trans flag. I measured across the pattern piece level at a bunch of different places, divide each measurement by five, then mark out sections of two, two, one. So when I did up the side seam with the front and the back, you'd have five equal size stripes across the whole half of the body. And then just as I was getting ready to draw out a whole new set of pattern pieces, I realized the bisexual flag is not equal widths of stripes. There's two thick stripes and a middle thin one. So if you tape the two, two sections back together, I could use the exact same pattern, like some kind of genius. By the way, I traced these two patterns on either side of the same pattern pieces, so I literally had to cut it up, cut a whole bunch of shapes, tape it back together again, flip it over, and cut it up in a different direction. Like some kind of genius. For the record, though, I bought 16 meters of double width poly cotton sheeting in nine colors. And what with the linings as well, I barely had enough for both gowns. <sighs> well, I guess it's pride, go big or go home. Keeping track of where each different piece was supposed to go was its own puzzle. And this completely dominated my work from floor until I got everything sewn together. I actually delayed refitting my workroom until I'd sewn them together because I knew if I moved them, I would mix bits up. I baglined these instead of doing a more historical flat lining because like hell was I flat felling all of those seams. I had to do enough hand sewing as it was, finishing up all the different edges where they were openings. But I did do hand stitched eyelets for the lacing. So, you know, maybe it evens out. Then it was too hot to wear it out. Then it was too torrential rain and wind to wear it out. But finally, finally, I scaled back my plans significantly, just put it on and went out in the garden to get some footage of the final outfit.
Hello friends, I'm back for the second half of the video. But Ash, this video is already hella long. I know, I don't care. Buckle up, buttercup. We're doing Q and A's before I get to the final announcements. I asked for questions about costuming and all the queer community and boy, did you guys deliver. What's a good first garment that isn't a skirt or a dress? Oh my God, if I see another beginner sewing book that starts off by making a skirt. Okay, so an apron is a great shout. So as a cloak, basically all the same skills as a skirt, but unisex and you want a cloak right? Everyone wants a cloak. Pouches and simple bags once you're ready to handle heavy materials like canvas and heavyweight interfacing. Pajamas. Next step up but still super simple. If they're a bit rubbish it doesn't matter because strangers won't see them. After that I think you should probably look to what you want to specialise in. So if you really want to be a historical costumer you're going on to rectangle construction shirts and shifts but if you want to do you know modern menswear it's maybe time to look at a simple waistcoat or a unlined bomber jacket. How do you signal non-binary in your costume? costuming choices. Boy, I wish I knew the answer to that one. One option if you have historical costume to play with is to give clearly mixed signals in the gender of the clothes you're wearing, but wow, you really have to mash them together until people get the hint that you're not a tomboy or just playing a woman or just playing a gay man. Another option is to take out as many gendered markings as you possibly can. This works really well for sci-fi and go for something a bit alien and constructed like, do I actually have a body or am I just a swarm of bees wearing this androgynous structure of brass and silk? We just don't know. Uh, the other tip I have I actually got off TikTok, which is you take something that is clearly associated with one gender and then you add a layer on top of that that is traditionally associated to the other binary gender and then you add an inexplicable third layer of either gender where by any right mind there should not be another layer. And then accessories. I, I don't know why it works, but... It kind of does. What trick of sewing looks really complicated but is actually simple and makes stuff look great? Answer one, hand finishing. I know it takes some practice, but use the smallest needle you can comfortably hold and work from there. If you think it's gonna look garbage if you shove it under the machine, it will almost always look fancier if you do it by hand. Answer two, some kinds of patchwork are really forgiving but people think they look wild. Case in point, my fragile coat, which has two different kinds of really basic patchwork, both of which look awesome. Answer three, bias binding. You can make your own bias binding the fabric used for the rest of the project, it's the easiest thing in the world, you don't need any special tools, and it looks really neat and professional. What are some of the things the costuming community can learn from the LGBTQ plus communities and vice versa? So big general sweeping statements here. The queer community is by definition diverse because you don't choose to become queer, you just are. And at some point you're probably going to want to talk to some other queer people, right? And yet the queer community still struggles massively with racism, sexism, transphobia, ableism, classism, the list goes on. Now you choose to become part of the costuming community, right? You have to look at this hobby and choose to get involved and choose to invest the time and effort and money to build up your skills and go to events. And the costuming community is not that diverse. And I think a lot of people don't even realise that's a problem because everyone here chose to be here, right? In the abstract and wasn't influenced by any other factors like gender, race, lack of role models, income inequality, disability, whatever, right? So if the LGBTQ plus community is diverse fundamentally and still having all these equality issues internally, what makes the costuming community think they're doing great? You know? In terms of what the queer community can learn from costuming, costuming offers a very different perspective on history than what you learned in school, probably. You're still being aware of big dates and battles and kings and industrial movements, but you're zeroing in on the differences that made to people's lives, sometimes very specific people at very specific times, and on a subject that wasn't actually widely recorded. You develop a way of researching and understanding history as a subject, even costume history as a subject, that makes you go, okay, yeah, that's what happened, but that's not the end of the story. What about everyone else, what am I missing, what don't I know? We've got there over time, like we're building on the work of pioneering dressed historians in the 60s and 70s, but I don't think queer history has quite got to the same saturation level yet. Queer history can sometimes be presented as, you know, here they are, the six gay people in all of European history, pick which one you're going to fanatically over identify with. It doesn't have to be like that. Queer history is rich and broad and plentiful, and queer historians are now really digging into that. There are some great projects out there, I'm going to put a card up to the time I talked to James about this 
historical crossdressers project because you should all check that out. It's great and it's not the only one. But I feel like a lot of average non-history orientated queer people are still like Anne Lister, James Barry or Oscar Wilde. Gotta pick one because those are my options. No, you've, you've got a history. It's there. It's just been ignored a long time. And we're starting to bring it to light and you can look to another discipline of history that's very visibly getting past the people saying that's not real history, there's no point studying that, there's nothing there, and see where we've got to. How is costuming a character for an online role-playing game different from an in-person LARP? So I'm assuming this refers to the games that are played on video over Discord or Zoom or whatever because that makes sense. A LARP costume has to look good from all angles. You have to think about comfort, movement, durability, weather conditions. If you can put it on in a tent, if you're going to have time to do this every morning, what happens if you're running late to the event? But that gives you so many more aspects to play with, including that you can mix big bold strokes to be seen from very far away with very small details that are only visible up close. And you can work across all of your senses, not just sight. On a video call, people are only seeing this much of you. It's probably only this big and anything other than visuals is not going to come across except I guess sound, but don't incorporate sound into your costume in a way that's going to affect the flow of the game. Okay, no background music, don't attach bells to yourself. If you're going to use a voice changer or something, test it and be prepared to drop it if people can't understand you. So you only have a small space with which to work and details that are too small or too big just won't read. So there's some serious limitations there. How? Ever. You don't have to move. Your costume will never be seen from any other angle. You can temperature control your space. You have lots of off-camera areas to hide color changing light bulbs, switches for different effects, ultraviolet lights, a fog machine. Your whole costume can be body paint and artfully draped fairy lights and garlands on top of a t-shirt. You can attach yourself to strings like a marionette that just go off screen. You can build a halo out of cardboard and hot glue and just prop it up behind you. Or you can do none of that. Roll out of bed five minutes before the workshops and chuck a scarf over your messy hair because you know exactly how long you have to get ready and you have access to all of your stuff because you don't have to travel. In-person LARP costumes have more limitations but you have a bigger variety of aspects to work with. Online games you can basically only do one thing at a time but that thing can be as wild as you can imagine and bodge together. If I'm a sewist and I realise I'm queer, where would you point me? What if I'm queer and I want to get into sewing? So these are actually broadly the same answer going in different directions, so bear with me if this gets muddled. Firstly, education. You're already in a great place with YouTube, but if you prefer books or in-person events or classes, great, dig in. At first you're not going to know what you want to learn more about specifically, so learn anything you can. On YouTube, if you're starting sewing, I would recommend channels like Annika Victoria, Scraps and Sequins, Cool Lyrapa, Kiralee Cosplay and The Closet Historian as great tutorial channels that give a lot of details and instruction and you can follow along as you go. If you're after more about queer life and history, uh, Jessica Calderon Fozza, Jeremy Dodger, Jade Fox, Kaz Rowe, that's just off the top of my head of people I've watched recently. There's a lot out there. You know any others that you want to particularly recommend, drop them in the comments below. Not to mention there's also a ton of queer content on streaming services like Netflix. Yes, I'm sure someone has already told you to watch Paris is Burning and Pride, but you know, for the one person who didn't already know about them. Second, community. Look for other people like you to connect with. That might be in person once the plague time ends, or it might be online through a forum, discord server, Instagram, Facebook group. Go to events, talk to folk, reach out, ask questions. If people are dicks to you, screw them, they're not your people. There's plenty more that aren't dicks, go find them. And finally, joy. Whether you're exploring your queer identity and the overwhelmingly depressing slog that is LGBTQ+, plus history, or you're putting pressure on yourself over your sewing ability in that upcoming event, you need to find space to feel joy. Maybe it's showing off your work on social media, or reading a fantasy novel with some quality gay rep, or maybe it's having a photo shoot of your latest project. Maybe it's watching drag queens against a green screen totally fail to stay on topic. Maybe it's walking out the house in a garment you made, or maybe it's just spending your lunchtime watching silly gay memes on TikTok. Just remember to find joy in what you do and who you are. Also, watch out for transphobes on both sides. How would you go about incorporating historical queer fashion slash subcultures slash signals into your costumes? So this is really interesting to me because a big part of queer signaling and a big part of costuming, particularly but not exclusively at LARP games, is recognition. You are speaking a language and the point is that other people who also speak that language will understand you. So it could be great to research the 18th century 
discover that a certain fashion among men was considered vaguely queer coded and I definitely think you shouldn't separate the aesthetics from the coding. Like if I'm going to use that visual language it's going to be to portray a queer man or a queer man might use it because it resonates with him. Not just because I like how it looks or I want to portray a heterosexual woman but she's into the aesthetic you know. And this is difficult the further back you go because things are often not this clear cut. It's normally far more vague. Are these newspapers mad about women wearing masculine sculled waistcoats while riding because they're manly and possibly gay or because they just hate women having independence? But you also have to accommodate for the fact that a modern audience might not know this is queer coding. So on the one hand you can't rely on it in quite the same way you can rely on modern queer coding like the drag aesthetic and that might not be an issue. Maybe it's there for you and your experience. Maybe it's inadvertently something that still seems queer. Fancy historical menswear for some reason really queer coded in the modern day no matter who's wearing it. But also you need to maybe be prepared to do some educating. So when after the game someone's like I really liked your kit you can go thank you it's based on what the 18th century thought a queer man dressed like. I chose it for these reasons. Not so much because you're going this is my aesthetic you're not allowed it but because you need to say this clothing has meaning it doesn't exist in a vacuum. Honestly that's true of a lot of historical clothing this is just a really good example of it. Haha <laughs> You are back to sleep deprivation ash because I didn't write an outro for this video until just before I did this recording. Anyway I hope you've enjoyed this video. I know it's been a bit all over the place but what do you expect by this point? Couple of final points. In the description you will find some links including one where you can donate to support this channel on Ko-fi. We're making great progress on my current goal which is to make a series about costuming LARP characters aiming to start that kind of November time and if you donate £10 or more you'll get a shout out in one of my Halloween videos. Oh boy, will there be Halloween videos? Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. Do all the things that make the YouTube gods happy and uh, follow me on Instagram. I do sometimes remember to post there. It's mostly cat pictures. And finally, the second video that's going to follow this one. While writing this video and answering all the really good questions that I got, I found I had a lot more to say on one specific topic which is uh, costuming and costume events are not all that welcoming to trans people and in some cases are borderline or actively hostile. So the next video on this channel is going to be all about how that happens and how we can do better. I do not expect it will be a particularly fun one but I hope you stick around for it anyway because for obvious reasons I think it's really important. Until then, dream big and I'll catch you next time. There is a strange cat in the garden and Thursday is doing absolutely nothing about it. Good to know. Uh... Oh, and Heidi's chasing butterflies or flies or some kind of insect. And he's being watched by another cat who is being watched by Thursday. Mmm, fractal kittens. Okay, focus up.